got the canoes out here today to show you guys what to look for when looking for a canoe. If you're going to purchase it or even rent it, it's good to know the different things you should be looking for in the design of the canoe, the capacity, maybe even the building materials. Now why do you want a canoe? It gets you out into nature. You can go as deep as you want, as many days as you want. You don't have to put fuel in it. You just got to fill yourself. And I've been close to moose in a canoe. I've been close to all kinds of different wildlife. I mean, you got to respect it, keep your distance, but it is amazing. You're going to see things in a canoe you'd never see in a motorboat. That also goes for kayaks and stand-up paddle boards. But my personal favorite is the canoe. And I honestly love getting out with the family in it. You can... They're the boat that has the most qualities for what I do. Lots of capacity, very comfortable, flat bottom so it's stable. I love it. It handles beautifully in the water. The canoe itself really took hold for a pleasure craft in 1865. And since then, they began building them as cedar strip canoes, and the composition has just skyrocketed. Now you can get into carbon fiber canoes, which are super light, but you're going to pay the price for that. They're a very expensive boat. When you're paddling a canoe, you're paddling a little bit of Canada's history. This is the first canoe I ever owned, made by the Holy Cow Canoe Company. They're in Acton, Ontario. When I bought this, they were still they were still pretty small. I think they've gotten a lot bigger. I bought this uh, 10 years ago. It has been amazing. Honestly, I put her through a lot. This boat I purchased because it's 15 feet long and I figured at the time that would be far more manageable. The fact that I can solo it very easily, which is something you want to think about because my 17 footer is a little harder to solo in. So what you do when you solo is you actually sit in the front seat facing backwards and that gives you a lot of weight distribution that makes it perfect for handling you might want to sit to one side a little bit so it's easier to get that paddle in the water you are gonna have a blast and then you can load the front up with all your gear even in the back it gives you a kind of a trunk which is handy the other thing about this canoe was that it, it could convert into a family canoe in which I would put my kids right in here my wife could sit here, I can sit back there, and it's very comfortable. My wife and I went on a backcountry canoe trip into Algonquin with this, and it was a blast. So this is a 15-foot prospector made out of Kevlar. It weighs in 52 pounds roughly, so you can pick it up with one arm pretty easy. It's a sensible price. They sell their product for a good, good price. I uh, don't know what it's selling for right now, but when I picked this up, it was 1500 bucks. All right, guys, let's talk anatomy of a canoe. There's all kinds of different parts, and you might hear when you're talking to somebody, especially if you go looking to buy one, and they're going to start throwing the different names of the different parts at you, and it's going to be a lot if you're not used to hearing it. There's a lot of the basics, like you got your seats, your yoke, your gunnels, your hull, but I'm going to get into that a little deeper. So your seats, how do you know it's the front seat? Well, there's a big space for your feet in front of it. Some canoes, actually, the back seat has quite a bit of space behind it, and it isn't obvious. Your front seat sits back closer to the center of the boat, called the amidships. When you're looking for a boat, if you can find a front seat that looks a little bit more comfortable than other ones, that is going to be key to you enjoying your trip. These are woven, straight style seats. They're comfortable. But when you're on this for hours and hours and hours, it starts to get a little uncomfortable on the back bar. So we usually put cushions on them. That makes a big difference. Now right here, you have what's called a gunnel. There are many different types of gunnels out there. These are extruded aluminum gunnels. So they're actually one piece that fits right over the Kevlar sheet. Stood up to some serious damage. I've dropped the canoe, you know, drug it along things. Even at one point I had on our trailer which had steel angle iron bars and the steel was starting to go through the pads and into the gunnels and it held up actually fairly well. A little bit of paint fixed that oh, problem. You have your gunnels, you have your seats. In the center here you have what is called a yoke. Now you can get a really basic yoke that doesn't have this cutout in it and the cupping. And if you get that, be aware that is going to be highly uncomfortable for you. This cup style yoke is the way to go. You can get some with padding, you can get some with different depths to the cup, 
you can get some that don't even have this little spine notch, which you're going to want because that's going to dig in, especially if you're doing some serious port dodging. If this canoe is just for around the cottage and it's not plan you're not planning on using it for a lot of things, I wouldn't worry about putting the extra money into that style of a yoke because they can get pretty pricey depending on the type of comfort you want, just like all things, right? Here you have what is called a thwart. And these are really good. They give a lot of rigidity to the canoe. Not only that, but it gives you something to tie things to. Now, when I'm portaging, there's a lot of times where there's a lot of things floating around, and we will use those twist ties to tie things right up to the thwart, the yoke, and the seats. Your paddles, your fishing poles. There's lots of things that you don't want to stick in your backpack that would be really handy to bind up and lash into your canoe. One of the big things I like to look into is the beam of the canoe. You might say, well, what's a beam? Well, the beam is the middle of the canoe and it's the width of it. So if you hear about, say, motorboats or yachts and they're talking about the beam, for those boats, it's the widest point. So in a motorboat, it's at the back by the transom. But in a canoe, because the canoe is typically symmetrical, it's actually the widest point in the center. So this canoe comes in at 37 inches wide at the top. Now, the beam doesn't necessarily always refer to the width of the gunnels. On my Swift canoe, it's actually lower on the hull because the hull flares out and then comes back in at the top. And I'll show you that a little later. The depth of your canoe is also important. This canoe has a 13.75 inch depth. So that means from the bottom, to the plane of the gunnels is 13.75 inches deep. And that is huge for a couple of different reasons. One, obviously, is your gear. You're gonna want your gear as settled into the boat as possible. If you have heavy winds and there's waves cracking against the hull, it keeps your stuff somewhat dry. You should also cover your things, but at the end of the day, we don't like anything getting wet in the canoe. We could admit that. So that's one positive. The other is, if you're out on white water or really wavy lakes, having that extra height really helps keep you above the waves. There was a year that my friends and I, we went to North Tea Lake in Algonquin Park. And in this boat, we were hitting three foot swells easily. And we were having no troubles, no water was coming in at all. Meanwhile, our friends in the other canoes, they were actually getting a lot of water coming in to the boats that they had to both bail and paddle at the same time and it kind of became a little sketchy. In those instances, I really recommend you just pull to the side and hunker down until the storm's done. That's your depth in the center. There's also another depth that you have to look into when buying a canoe. It is the depth at the bow and the stern. So on a prospector, that's the same depth. I typically focus on the prospectors. There's many different styles out there. So on this one, the depth at the bow and the stern is 22 inches, which is also very handy when you're hitting those big waves. Just think as this boat's coming down into the trough of a wave, you don't want that trough to come up into the boat. So having that extra height makes a big difference. Now this is your bow in front of the front seat and the stern or aft is the back behind the back seat the decks of a canoe. Well, interestingly enough, if you thought of this as like a big galleon, what would be the decks? It'd be the top portion. So these tiny little end caps are the decks. On here, they're plastic, and I'm gonna be honest, this has been out in the sun a lot, and these have held up no problem at all. So if you're thinking, well, I don't want those plastic ones to kind of fade out on me. Remember, this is a decade old, and these are still looking good. I can't complain at all. You have your handles up in here for moving it around. Now they will tell you, you don't use these handles when you have all your gear in the boat because they are not designed to hold the entire boat and all your gear. We've had this boat loaded up and we have used these handles. I don't recommend it and they've held up. So that shows you there's a lot of strength in these gunnels. This is what I was talking about right here, where it has actually begun to wear into the keel. Now, in this instance, if I was to keep this boat, I would actually want to add a keel guard 
all the way down to here as this is clearly a wear spot I'm not entirely sure why because it's at the it's at the rear of the boat the aft section but as you can see it's definitely a problem something that's going to happen over time and it's completely normal with these gel coats something that's going to happen over time that's normal with these gel coats is this gel coat cracking right here now why that is because over time gel coats actually are a slower hardening product than the kevlar weave and over time they fully harden and they don't flex the same way that the kevlar does so in these very rounded sections with this radius this is where they really see the most stress so if you see this on a boat all it means is the gel coat's cracking and you might have to do a repair but if you're buying a used boat that that's not necessarily something to deter you it isn't going through the main hull it's just the outside now if the crack looks way worse and you think it might be going through the hull that's something that i would be a little worried about especially if i'm purchasing a used boat